Trinity, and I'm going to be one of three teachers this semester. Megan and Lisa are going to help, and so we're going to have a team teaching approach, approach this semester. And if you do not get the Friday emails, uh, they usually during this season have the lecture uh, on a podcast, like an audio or a video, if you miss and just want to keep up. But no rush. That's just generally a women's only email that goes out on Friday. So it has some podcasts, like the video, whatever I just said, and it has like blogs and things that I think are interesting for women at church. So anyway, that's just my plug. So if you do not get it on Friday, this Friday, that means I don't have it in my system. And just let me know and we will take care of that. Um, the book, you should have gotten it. Let me ask if you have not registered. If One, if you had trouble registering, just shoot me a text or an email and I will take care of that. I'll register you for you and you can just give me 20 bucks but if you have not registered go ahead and register take your book today but just be sure to register so you're you know, like if we email about lunch bunch you'll get the email and stuff like that and you can pay your 20 dollars now if the 20 dollars is a thing which in my life it has been before you can come talk to me and that little 20 dollars is it's like monopoly money we will just take care of that okay so that is my spill on the book this week there was no homework but for next week if you look on your in your book on page i think 16 that is where week two's homework work starts that's what we encourage y'all to do by next week it'll just get you in the passage it'll get you familiar with what we'll be talking about but no one's checking homework we're not grading homework and you're not even going to really discuss it unless you have a question and the discussion questions for your small group will be on page 28. Ignore anything that says something about a video. I'm your video. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know you are wishing you had Jen Wilkin, but unfortunately you have season time. And so this is also a previous edition. She just came out like in January with her new Sermon on the Mount, with her new videos. So have at it. Um, use that if you want to have extra stuff that is great but just for this study that's kind of how we're just going to do it we're going to um have discussion about the lesson after we have a lecture so anyway have any other questions about your book please talk to your small group leaders and if you've never been here before which several of you haven't so you're in good company um we usually have um announcements snacks coffee and then we have a teacher talk for about 30 to 35 minutes and then we break into our small groups and we love to keep those small groups the same so you can develop relationships and accountability and just get to know each other um, but you're never going to be asked to pray or to share if you're not comfortable so this is really we want this to be a really great place for you to grow spiritually grow and get to know the women and just have a warm little oasis on Thursday mornings, okay? Um, so, all that being said, I'm so happy you're here. I'm so happy. If I've not met you, please come come meet me. Um, if you've met me once and you want to talk about anything, I get paid to do that, and I love it. Mm -hmm. So, my number is in the bulletin on Sundays. Um, you should have gotten it in an email from me. If you're registered, I've already emailed you once. Um, so just know that I'm here and I love to get to know new women or just sit and talk with women I've known for five years since I've been here. Mm -hmm. So, okay, Whew. that's all the, the rigmarole. Now we get to do what we've came to do, which is look at God's word. And thank you, Meredith, so much for praying. Um, we cannot do this without the Holy Spirit's help. But while you turn your Bibles open to Matthew 5, we're going to look at 1 through 2. We're going to start very slow. We are, we're studying two verses today. That is the kind of Bible study I like. So, also you should have a handout on your table. If you don't, they're up here. It doesn't bother me if you get up and look. Um, but uh, that is just a way to follow along on the lecture. So, Okay. Matthew 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. And then what he started saying 
is what we're going to talk about next week. Okay. So what this week we really want to do is give ourselves like a, like a, like a ramp to take off into the Sermon on the Mount. Um, on the handout, you also have a list of commentaries and resources I'm using. I have read so much in such a little amount of time that it is all swimming in my head. I just want to say that these people are smarter than I am. Go look. If I say something that piques your interest, it's coming from one of those places. There are tons of great resources on Sermon on the Mount. Ask your small group leaders if you are curious. Definitely watch the video by Bible Project. It is like kindergarten seminary. I love it. It is really good for me when my brain is fried. Um, one of the things I love is this is following up our judges series last semester. That is what happens, what happened in Judges and what we saw, and we were all limping out of Judges, if I remember. We were so distraught over the horror and violence of the last scenes of Judges that this is such a good um, way to take what we found out that what happens when man is in charge. When God's people Basically, the church of the Old Testament ran God's kingdom their way. It ended in greed and the vulnerable being taken advantage of and a concubine being cut up, dismembered, and shipped across the 12 tribes. I mean, horror, horror and tragedy. That's what God's people did with what God gave them when they tried to run God's people their way. And we were glad to get out of Judges because really, if you had stayed and kept on going, you would have seen that it wasn't just the period of Judges. That happened in the period of the Kings. It happened, it's just happened throughout time. So when God's people are in charge, not even the world, God's people are in charge, things go awry. Mm -hmm. And here we have Jesus who comes on the scene in Matthew, the first gospel, and he sits down and says, this is the way I want my kingdom to go. This is how the king says you're going to live in the kingdom that he sets up. And I'm just going to go ahead and give the spoiler. It's still not easy. I'm personally a little nervous about this Bible study. I've had a hard 23. I've had a hard 2023. I've had a hard year. And when I turn over my calendar and I'm facing a new year and I have this Bible study where it says, even when you do what Jesus says to do, it includes suffering. It includes hard things. It includes loving your enemy. It includes turning a cheek. It includes not letting be what our culture says is important as important. And it's going to take struggle. But that is part of living in this kingdom because the king himself had to struggle. Jesus had to go through hard things to provide this beautiful kingdom that we're going to learn about in the Sermon on the Mount. So what I want to do is look at how the Sermon on the Mount fits into our Bible, kind of like the Bible timeline. Like if you took the Bible and put it up on a wall, the timeline of it, where does this fall into the story of God's people and the story of the Bible? The second thing we're going to do is look at the way the Sermon on the Mount fits into the book of Matthew because that's important. And I got all of that from the Bible Project. So I can't include everything, but definitely listen to what they've got on that. And then lastly, I want to talk about how does the Sermon on the Mount fit into your life? So we're going to look at the context within the Bible, within the book of Matthew, and then within your everyday life. Okay, so let's start. First of all, I want us to remember that the Bible story, the whole story of the Bible is one big, like, fairy tale story. It's about a damsel in distress who got into a horrible mess, who was taken hostage, trapped in a dungeon, and the hero of the story, the Prince Charming, comes, slays the dragon guarding that dungeon, and frees her. And then says, not only have I freed you, but I want to marry you. I want us to be family. 
God's church, God's people, is that is the bride. And Jesus is Prince Charming, and Satan and the evil forces of this world have us. Have us. We screwed it up. We put ourselves in the dungeon when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And at that very moment in Genesis 3, God says, don't worry. I'm going to rescue you. I wanted to live with you. I wanted a relationship with people in this beautiful world, and I'm going to get it, even if it costs me. And that's what happened. You have all the Bible. We're not going to talk. We keep, what time limits us. But basically, what was lost in the garden, that relationship, is the rest of the Bible, God getting it back. And all of the Old Testament is pointing to what kind of rescue that is going to be. It's going to be through unlikely and small ways. He's going to use unlikely people, small events, wimpy looking situations to do something huge. There's going to be suffering and death. Those Old Testament sacrifices hinted that the prince was going to have to die to win back this princess. And even when the princess even when the object of his affection is rude, rather stay in the dungeon than be with him. He doesn't stop chasing and rescuing her. What's the point? The whole point of the Bible is God says, I want to live happily ever after with my people. I love them. I enjoy them. I delight to be in relationship with my creatures, my creation. And I will move heaven and earth to do it. And so the happily ever after is still ahead of us because it culminates when Jesus comes back and it's our wedding day. And no matter how ugly that bride has been, and we talked about this in Judges, no matter how ugly God's people have acted, every bride on her wedding day is gorgeous, right? Even the plainest of girls, even the ones who've been a little sassy to their mama that morning, once she puts on that dress, everybody looks at her and says, she is gorgeous. And Jesus is, can't wait for that day. So Jesus, the hero of that story, that big fairy tale, in Matthew, sits down and starts talking. And he is like the new Moses that we see in the Old Testament. Um, in your handout, I've got Isaiah 2, 3, which says, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. This to us, we're like, we think this is just directional, like a stage play. Jesus exits stage left, comes on the stage and sits down. We just think somebody's just filling space, right? The Bible never has an accidental or throwaway word. What is being communicated, and if we were Jewish, we would probably know this by reading the text, is that just like Moses went up to the mountain and got the Ten Commandments and the law of God, Jesus is going up to a mountain like a new Moses, and then sitting down is significant because a rabbi, a, scribe, a teacher, sat when he was teaching. It's kind of the opposite of what we do. Instead of the teacher standing at the front of the room, he sat down in the room. So what we need to pick up on is this Jesus, this hero, Prince Charming, is coming as a teacher with authority. And he is giving his first big speech of Matthew in Sermon on the Mount. Okay, if you look at just, and we'll talk about this a little bit, you know, Matthew has been building up saying, okay, here's this baby, you know, here's Jesus. He has this genealogy. Um, he was baptized. He was tempted. And then, boom, these are the first, like, lessons that Jesus is giving. He's actually doing what Moses hoped he would do. Back on your handout, Deuteronomy 3, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. This was written by Moses centuries before. And it's so funny because sometimes we think about Moses and the law. We're like, 
keep a list, check it off so you can be good enough to get into heaven, which wasn't true then. They had already been saved from slavery. God was just giving them family rules to be safe, to live like their father. But that is exactly what Jesus is doing here. It's just that law is getting expanded and explained, and it's just a lot more. It's like instead of 2D, it's 3D now. And really the other prophets were saying similar things after Moses. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. We even see this in the New Testament when Paul writes in Romans 2, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision, circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. And a one way to see this is this was the point of the law and of the rescue the whole time. Just like in any relationship, whether you've got a best friend or you're married or maybe it's someone like a sibling and a parent relationship, nobody enjoys a relationship where it's only superficial. I texted her on her birthday. I came to Christmas. I make him food every day, but there's no affection. There's no heart there. All the outward things are check, check, check. But you go to Christmas and you don't talk. You text on the birthday, but you aren't kind to your friend when she's having a hard day. You're kind of jealous of her. Or that sibling or that parent that you're like, or spouse, I, I wash his dirty socks, but you give him the cold shoulder when he comes home from work. That's what God is saying. I don't want that kind of relationship. I want a heart relationship where we're in love with each other, where it's honest and what happens on the inside is what's happening on the outside. In a way, and I've used this illustration before, but it just helps me that all the stuff in the Old Testament, all the laws, all the sacrifices, all of this is pointing ahead to what kind of rescue this is going to be it was like if you've ever had a baby and you go to the doctor and you get a sonogram and you put that little picture on your fridge and that's first of all sonograms are easy to feed right <laughs> sonograms do not wake you up in the middle of the night right <laughs> no they are there for you to enjoy but who wants to be stuck in sonogram face nobody you want the baby jesus comes on the scene and says that picture that picture that the Pharisees and the religious rulers could not let go of because they could control it when the baby came Jesus it flipped them out and it's gonna flip us out too sometimes Jesus offers us a way the real way he meant for it to be the whole time the kingdom of God the way God dreamed it would be and it may challenge us this semester. It may surprise us. Some of this is hard stuff. But I will tell you, we're choosing to hold the baby instead of keep the sonogram. During this rescue story, we have seen how God promises his people in the Old Testament and in the New that what he wants is his people to flourish. And that word, we're going to... We're going to kind of hold on to that word as we read words like blessed next week. That it's not just he wants you to be happy. Happy is like, oh, yay, my Netflix account still works. <laughs> happy is, oh, yes, I have clean underwear this morning. 
I had one pair, y'all. That's all I needed. Happy. Happy is that my car is not frozen. What happy is good. Jesus is like happy is a sonogram. How about flourish? How about flourish and be whole and be blessed and be operating the way you were meant to? The way that is full of blessing. Now, through, and we should know this from looking at the Old Testament so far in our fall Bible studies. When did God's people tend to do the best? When they were obedient. When they were doing life the way their father did life. When they were aligned with God's will and his plans for them. And when they left his side and wandered off against other gods and cozied up into some other man's God's bed, hell broke loose. And they wept. And they said, please take us back. And God did. Over and over and over. Likewise, Jesus lays out for us this semester in Sermon on the Mount a way to live this fulfilled life. But he wants you to live it like he says to live it, not how we want to live it. From my Bible notes, they had a great quote that I thought was really helpful for me. In all of these cases, obedience did not earn the blessings, yet obedience was always connected to those blessings. Okay? Obeying God never, ever has gotten you anywhere with God. You cannot. It, you will never obey him enough to be okay enough to be in a relationship with him. He's just so holy and we are so not. The Sermon on the Mount makes the same correlation. If you read this Sermon on the Mount and think, I got to do all that for Jesus to love me, I'm telling you right now, no. Jesus knows you can't do this. That's why he came to save us. That's why we need the rescuer. This is how the world should work if Jesus were the king of all. He is the king of all. He has just not come to like put down all the enemies yet. There's still the, the tail of the snake wiggling, even though Jesus cut off Satan's head at the cross. But it is going to put our culture, not just the world's culture, not just American culture, it is going to put Fort Worth culture, Tanglewood's mom culture, West Fort Worth culture, Texas culture, Democratic, Republican, however, whatever culture you're steeped in right now, it's going to challenge it. That's going to be uncomfortable for us. That is why I am dreading <laughs> this Bible study. Because I know, I like to be comfortable. But the blessing will be such an ultimate joy. And despite the pain and suffering of following Jesus on this path, we will be so whole and so contented and so secure in where we are going. And like Peter, when Jesus said, when he mentioned suffering and a lot of his disciples started leaving, Jesus asked Peter, do you want to go too? And what did Peter say? Where else am I going to go? So, that is how the Sermon on the Mount fits into the Bible. Now, how does it fit into the book of Matthew? Well, first of all, and this is kind of more school, school teacher of me, and this is when I really wish I had a whiteboard, because I love a whiteboard, and I just feel like I've lost an arm without whiteboard and markers, but I'm going to try to do this just with hand signals, okay? <laughs> but this is kind of how to picture it. I got a sandwich. I got two pieces of bread and two meats. It's like one of those double meat sandwiches where you have salami and ham or something like that, okay? So we've got the bread, the first slice of bread, chapters 1 through 4. This is Matthew getting you ready to meet Jesus, who he was, all the prophecies about, about him. It keeps on saying he did this, that the prophecy would be fulfilled. He did this. It's, it's saying here's the hero of the story. The one you've been waiting on is coming. He's coming. And then, boom, he sits down in chapter 5. And then you start feeling the meats. The meats are chapters 5 through 25, and it's all his teaching and all his healing. Those are the two meats, teaching, 
healing. And they kind of go back and forth. It's like a layered meat thing. Between all, you know, the hams are the salamis. The hams are the teaching. Truth. Salami, he touches someone and heals them. You see the authority of Jesus. Then you see the mercy of Jesus. You see you're going to hell if you don't repent. And you see, and I'm powerful enough to save you from hell if you come to me. And I want to save you. And it's such a great combo meat package, right? So his main message is turn around, stop what you're doing, and go the other way. We like to say that's the word repent. But what it means is stop, do a 180, and go the other direction. Because where you're going is off a cliff. Come to me, Jesus says. Come to safety. Come to life. And the good news is that he's there to do that. Now, in this section of meats, the Sermon on the Mount has ties to the final slice of salami. <laughs> okay? If you can stick to this illustration. Okay, so there are five huge sermons in Matthew. Okay? Sermon on the Mount is the first one. The last one, they kind of chorus correspond, and this is how. Chapters 5 through 7 that we're going to study this semester talk about how you're going to have blessings, how you're going to have shalom, how, how you're going to have peace by living this way, the kingdom of God way. Chapters 23 and 25, the last slice of meat, the last big sermon, is how you're going to have woes and not peace and not shalom if you live that way. So some of that Old Testament blessings and curses, that's what we're kind of talking about. Shalom versus a woe, okay? You can see this, and I've included Psalm 1. We're not going to read it. Psalm 1, the Proverbs. This is generally how life works for God's people. It's not a set of transactions. It's not, a, it's not put a quarter in, get a cookie out type stuff. Generally speaking, this is the way to live, and this is what will happen to God's people if they do. Then you get to the last slice of bread, which is just 26 through 28, and it's just a, all of a sudden, it's just a few days. It's Passover. It's crucifixion. It's resurrection, and it's, it's that last piece of bread. That is Matthew in a nutshell, or a sandwich, okay? The summary of God's teaching, and I got this just out of my Bible too, Bible notes. These are the three things Jesus teaches about. Kingdom of God, the saving work of Jesus, and the ethics of God's family. That Sermon on the Mount. Okay? The ethics of God's family. Um, maybe you have children or maybe growing up you wanted to do something. And maybe your parents said, or you've said, and you're like, oh my goodness, I sound like my mother. When you say, oh, I'm sorry, tiners can't do that. Tiners don't do that. Um, maybe it's uh, you loved your daddy, because I was a daddy's girl. And I loved it when people said, oh, that reminds me so much of your daddy. I loved that. Ethics of the family. Remember when the prodigal son came back home? You know, in that parable, we don't get what happened the next day. But Sermon on the Mount is what they talked about. That was the ethics of, you've already gotten into the house. You are here and loved. But this is what it looks like to live in our family. Okay. Now, all of that, that is all the Bible study stuff. And I know that's a lot. And believe me, if any of that piqued your interest, those commentaries are your friend. I am not. I will just say, here are my commentaries, okay? But what I like to do if I'm in a Bible study is say, great, that is so fascinating. I'm so glad to know that about the Bible and about Matthew. I love a sandwich, okay? <laughs> But I need to eat the sandwich, and I need some fuel for my life. So how does one eat that, okay? How does the sermon fit into my life? Because, look, nobody wants to give up a Thursday morning just to learn fascinating biblical stuff. 
as much as it is fun, and a lot of us do, we would give up Thursday morning to do that. But I want more for your time. Because the point of the Sermon on the Mount is not just informational, it's transformational. That's what I want this Bible study to be. It's not just, I checked it off my list. But I want you to leave here different. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. And he uses God's word and the community of believers to do that. So, how does this sermon fit into my life? What are the takeaways? First of all, the sermon is meant for more than a study of theology. Although it does teach us about God, we learn about his holiness, his mercy, his desire to bless us and establish us. So we're going to get that. But he, he also is looking at certain people when he does this. He's looking primarily at his disciples, people who have already committed to him, who are already in the family of God. But yet, there were curious onlookers hearing too. So it's also going to be evangelistic. And I want you to notice the disciples are a ragtag bunch of people. They are poor people. They are sinners. They are people who have messed up and people are mad at them. They're people that are like untrained, ordinary. They didn't go to seminary. They probably like just passed sixth grade. You know what I'm saying? Like they were better, you know, maybe on the football field and they got through geometry somehow. You know, I don't know. But they're just not like the highest people in society then. So if you feel like you are not up to snuff for this Bible study or for the Sermon on the Mount or for Jesus, I want to say you are just the type of woman he wants. He wants the woman who has just failed in her marriage, in her job, in her neighborhood, the one who just embarrassed herself by gossiping and getting caught, the one who's disappointed in her children but is too scared to say that out loud? The one who can't believe her dreams have not come true yet when she's done everything right? The women who are scared. The women who are sinners. The women who are, think, are flirting online right now with somebody and shouldn't be. The women who are struggling with eating disorders, with past abortions that haunt them. These are the women he says, you are my family. I use people like you to build my kingdom. Jesus is also given this sermon not as just the teacher, but as the one who makes it possible. He's going to die for this to happen. He's going to suffer immensely for you personally to flourish and for his church to flourish. And he will go to hell so you do not have to. And he also says the sermon is for our messy lives, our everyday lives. And Jesus is going to get so personal. And can I even say meddlesome? Because he's going to talk about your emotions, your hating, your grudges, your lusting, your worry. He's going to talk about your money. He's going to talk about your relationships, whether with somebody you love or somebody you would put in the frenemy category. <laughs> Somebody in between, he's going to talk about your ambitions. Whether it's to rule your world or rule the PTA or just rule your house. <laughs> and then Jesus is going to answer the question that the movie Barbie posed to us this summer. The, the whole Billie Eilish song that is stuck in our heads. What was I made for? What was I made for? Isn't that what we're all struggling with? And it's a question that the original audience, if you look at Greco-Roman times, definitely got this out of a commentary, ladies. <laughs> they were asking the same thing. They didn't even have Barbie. They didn't even have that movie. <laughs> they were asking, what's going to make me happy? That sounds so familiar. And it was a combo, Jesus said, of being flourishing and being whole. Consistency between your head your heart, and your hands. It's so interesting. When I prepared for our Barbie discussion night, I, I had some questions in mind, but I thought there has got to be something out there in the World Wide Web that's better than me, uh, like a book club discussion night or some questions. So I was looking, I found this site. I was like, these are great questions. These are very similar to the questions I had for our Christian discussion. I was like, what site is this? 
It was transgender children's side. So there you go. We all have questions, the same questions. Who is going to answer them? Who? Those websites or Jesus? Your mama or Jesus? Your best friends or Jesus? Who is going to give you the real answers? We are made a certain way. And Jesus says, live into the way the Creator's manual says it should be. So, is the Sermon on the Mount a rule manual? Well, I guess you could say it is, but it is so much more than that. Remember, it's the baby, not the sonogram. When God gives you a new heart, it beats a different way than your old heart did. Your old heart was dead. It had no beat. And God gives you a new heart. And yes, in Romans 7, Paul says our, that new heartbeat is struggling against the sin in our body. It's struggling. But let me tell you, God's new heart always wins. And the Sermon on the Mount appeals to that heartbeat. Now, if you're like me, I've been a believer since I was a little girl. But my heart that God gave me still gets cold, still gets weak, still gets distracted, gets discouraged wonders if God really is going to keep his promises to me. And Jesus says, a smoldering wick I will not snuff out and a bruised reed I will not break. And Jesus says to that cold, barely beating heart, let me warm you up. Lean this way towards me. Some of us may buck against this. Some of us may say, I don't want to. Like, what does he mean, tear my eye out, cut my hand off? What is going on? Some of us may go, I'm sorry, but I can't give up that for Jesus. And we're going to struggle with some of these things. But then I want you to remember where life would take you without Jesus. I want you to picture judges. And I want to picture the prodigal son eating pig slops. Okay? So as hard as the path is to follow Jesus in this sermon, it is far better than pig slops, right? Because <laughs> that makes me want to gag. Even now, you might be tasting pig slops. You may go, I don't, I don't think I'm out of the pig slop stage. I don't think I ever have had that new heart. And this sermon is for you too, because it is going to give you the hope and the name and the eyes of the rescuer that is already in love with you and says, come to me, wear my burden. It is light. It is easy. It will save you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, what do we have in this world besides <coughs> you that can give us peace when our worlds are topsy-turvy? When things are not going according to plan, we look at you and say, you've had a plan all along. But Father, our sins make us scared. The world makes us scared. Uh, people in our lives bully us. They, they make us feel like Jesus can't be enough. And we look at you and say, you are the only choice we have. I pray that you would woo us in this study, that you would encourage us, that you would build our faith, and that we would rejoice that we are loved by such a good God. In Jesus' name, amen. One last thing I forgot to just...